Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our consideration today is the Old Testament reading, which you heard just a few moments ago from Genesis, the third chapter. As I mentioned earlier, today we begin the first five-week exploration of ten weeks total, but we're taking just the first five weeks right now, an exploration of God's Word, the Scriptures. Each week we'll take a look at a real historical biblical event to learn what it teaches us about God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is God's great plan of salvation. Jesus is the beginning, the center, and the end of all human history. And as we hear and learn through these sermons, we'll better understand our lives and our place in the world in which we live. So, let's start at the beginning. The very first verse in the Bible reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says God brought the heavens and the earth into existence out of nothing using simply the power of his spoken word alone. For example, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 we read, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The first chapter of Genesis tells us how God formed the sky, made the dry land, filled the heavens with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and filled the earth with trees and vegetation, animals of all kinds, and mankind. So, you may well ask, yes, but where is Jesus Christ in all this? The Apostle John gives us the answer in the first chapter of his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Does that sound familiar? In the beginning? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You see, Jesus is the Word of God. He is the eternal Son of God. John calls Jesus the Word because God uses his voice, his spoken word, to bring everything into existence. So you see, the Son of God is there in the very beginning creating the heavens and the earth and everything in them side by side with his Father. But look at the world today. What a mess. There are natural disasters, droughts, floods, fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes. There is crime and war, illness and death. Well, where did all these horrible things come from? Did God make creation that way? And what, if anything, is God doing about it? Well, first, let's take a look at how things were after God first made the heavens and the earth. On the sixth day, after making everything, God stepped back to examine his handiwork. And Genesis 1 verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The bad things we see all around us only began to happen when the first humans, Adam and Eve, made a very tragic choice. We read about it in the third chapter. Of Genesis and it begins now the serpent was more crafty than the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made 
At this point in the Bible, the Bible does not specify who this serpent is, but other parts of the Bible make it very clear, especially in the 12th chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation, where there we read, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So who is the devil? God created him as a holy angel. More than that, he was an archangel, a ruler of angels, if you will, something like a four-star general. And just like Adam and Eve, he was holy when God created him. But sadly, this angel turned away from God and became the author of all evil and suffering that fills the earth, even that which afflicts the animals and the plants around us. The Bible does not describe how he fell into sin, but Satan persuaded a great number of other angels to join his unholy rebellion against their creator. And since his fall, Satan and his fallen angels have been enemies of God and his people. It was this devil who entered the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent hoping to lead our first human mother and father to join the rebellion against the Creator. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may not eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here the devil is directly contradicting God's word. You will surely die, God said. And the serpent said, You will not surely die. So to whom should Eve listen? To God who created her or to the serpent, a creature over which God had given her dominion? The answer is really quite obvious, but that temptation was so appealing she could gain a wisdom God had perhaps held back from her. Moses the prophet who later wrote down the words of Genesis records the thoughts that passed through Eve's mind as she looked at the forbidden fruit. We read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. St. Paul in his first letter to St. Timothy, has an interesting thing to say about Adam's role in all of this. He says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, think carefully about that. Eve was deceived. She believed the serpent was telling her the truth. But Adam saw through the deception. He knew it was all a lie. He knew the tree would not make them wise, and the day that they ate of it, they would surely die. Why in the world would Adam eat that fruit? Why didn't he step forward and put the serpent in its place? Why didn't he spring forward to protect Eve and all of us, his unborn children? No. He stood by and silently watched Eve grab that fruit, and then even worse, he took a bite of the fruit himself. Now, can you relate to that? I know I can. Sometimes we are deceived. We're deceived into doing something we really shouldn't do, even though God tells us not to. And other times we can clearly see that what it is that we should do, but we do the wrong thing anyway. The effect of, an, and the effect of Adam and Eve's sin was immediate. 
Our text says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Have you ever felt that searing guilt before? The deep burning shame and the desire to be able to turn back the clock? Our human nature was drastically changed by Adam and Eve's fall. We lost that image of God and now carry within us the sinful nature inherited from Adam and Eve. It is that sinful selfishness that gives rise to all the distrust, all the fear, all the hatred, all the crime, and the wars with our brothers and sisters in our human family. Even worse, we are powerless to turn toward God or to love Him. In fact, we are dead to God and hostile enemies toward Him. Now, does that seem fair? For you to be condemned as a sinner thousands of years before you were even born? Why should you suffer for what Adam and Eve did way back in the beginning? Because we, with our sinful nature, are all interconnected in this human family. None of us can ever be truly independent from everyone else. Think about this. Think about a car accident during rush hour in a big city. Thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of drivers are delayed because of a single accident. You see, every sin you or I commit, or any other sinner commits, ripples away outward, and it affects everyone else. So what's God's solution? He would have been just and right if he had decided to simply discard his creation. But God loved you and me and each descendant of Adam and Eve too much to just throw it all away. This is his world. And he stood up for it. He reclaimed it. He determined to fix it. So God came walking through his garden in the cool of the day to seek and find his lost children. Our text says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The feeling of exposure and nakedness Adam and Eve had first felt was nothing compared to the terror that gripped them now. In vain they tried to hide from God. Our text continues, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Adam answered, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Here is the time for Adam to make confession. Instead, the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Oh, did you catch that? Whose fault is it that he ate? It's hers. In fact, he's even saying, It was you, God, because you gave her to me. You see, the division has already started. So, God turns to Eve. What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. <laughs> She's no less innocent. As Adam pointed to Eve, what does Eve do? She points to the serpent. It's like, not me. It's got to be them. Now, don't we do the same thing? When you're caught red-handed, what do you say? I'm sorry, I'm guilty, take me away. No, we say, I didn't know, or they made me do it, or everyone else is doing it, so why can't I? We haven't changed, not much at all. So God turned then to Satan. 
And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In that moment, the Lord God announced his great plan to save humanity and restore his damaged creation. His eternal son would join the human family, one of Eve's descendants, and as true God and true man, he would crush the serpent's head. Satan received that mortal blow when Jesus Christ hung on that cross. Jesus suffered horribly as he was punished for Adam and Eve's sins, your and my sins, the sins of all humanity, including, remember, you and me. He died and he was buried, but he rose again on the third day. Since that day nearly 2,000 years ago, Satan is writhing in his death throes. He's still dangerous, but he's defeated and he's dying. Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden and their idyllic life was gone. They would have to labor and toil to raise food. The ground would no longer yield its strength to mankind. And we experience that when our labor is difficult, frustrating, and wearying. At the same time, we age. Our bodies grow frail. We get sick. We wear out. And eventually, we die. Bad things happen in this world but it won't be that way forever. God's mighty son, Jesus Christ, is coming back on the last day to throw Satan and all his angels into hell forever and ever, along with every human being who has rejected God's plan of salvation. Jesus Christ will restore broken creation and make all things new again. And he will transform us completely, body, mind, heart, and soul. <coughs> Which means we will then be good, just, loving, and pure. We will be responsible. We will be loving and accepting of every other believer, cherishing the gifts and the talents that God has given to everyone without any malice, envy, or jealousy of any sort. And the best thing of all is we will bask in the glory of God our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, our brother and our Savior. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We we'll now ask all of the Sunday school and midweek staff to come forward as we all stand and we sing.